Okay, hi everyone. Um, let's get this straight. Here we go. So yes, I'm excited to be a part of the workshop on theoretical phonology, which will take place in the very near future. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, food-based analysis of stress advancement in China. Um, I mean, and you'll hear all about that in the upcoming uh, 15, I guess, 20 minutes or so. Um, okay. First of all, I wanted to thank the organizers of the workshop, which I'm sure will be great. I have uh, high hopes for this workshop. Um, that being said, let me move on to my talk and summarizing it in one slide. So the claim that I'm making here is that so-called Mora stress in China is best analyzed as a difference in the association of post-lexical or international tone with two types of feet. So I say that the language contrasts moraic and syllabic trochies. Um, this talk has two goals. Um, first of all, I want to provide an explicit formalization of the mapping of international tones to foot structure. And then uh, I'll provide an analysis of what's called stress advancement. And I'll claim that this is actually evidence for a foot-based approach, or if you would like to hear it in other words, uh, that it fits very well into what a foot-based approach predicts should be possible. And in doing that, I hope to contribute to some long-standing debates in prosodic typology. Okay, so this is my outline, right? I'll talk about China languages, give you the basic facts, talk a bit about uh, typology and theory, and give you those two parts of the analysis that I've been talking about. Okay, China is a part of the Dardic subgroup of the Indo-Aryan family. We're talking about around 650,000 speakers, mostly spoken in northern Pakistan. Um, the focus in this talk will be on Kuistani China, um, which has around 370,000 local speakers. And all the data will be from Schmidt and Kuistani 2008. And from here, I'll just refer to them as uh, S and K. Okay, so this is a map you can see here in the upper part uh, of Pakistan. That's where Shina is spoken. And so why is Shina of particular relevance for prosodic typology and phonological theory? Well, two basic things that you have to know is that there is contrastive vowel length. So we have short and long vowels and stressed syllables. Um, unstressed vowels are always short. And then we have what's sometimes referred to as Mora stress. You can also refer to it as tonal accent or pitch accent. You know, I mean, Larry Hyman has written a lot about this. There are all these terms uh, floating around for phenomena where, as in China, in long stressed vowels, that a tonal prominence, some kind of accent can be on the first or the second part of a vowel. Here in this talk, I'll mark this as having an acute accent on the first part or the second part or what's also sometimes used in the literature is that you have an acute accent versus a grave accent. So the grave accent would be the accent on the second mora. And the literature also refers to it as falling versus rising accents. Um, short vowels do not show this kind of contrast. You always have high pitch. And I'll mark that as a one A symbol with an accent mark. Okay, here you get a few minimal pairs. So we have the word for push with accent on the first mora versus the word for agreement with accent on the second mora, the word for month with accent on the first mora, and the word for flash with accent on the second mora. And what I'm going to show you in just a second is the pitch contours for um, these words uh, recorded in phrase medial focus position from uh, Schmidt and Koestani. So here you see that's the falling pitch accent. Um, one thing to notice that I will return to is that the fall actually doesn't end in, uh, on the stressed vowel, but it continues towards the end of the phrase. Also notice that here there is a low target before that high tone. And for the rising accent, you can see that there is a rise within this syllable, and then you also get a fall towards the end of the phrase. Um, 
here you have it for the word Moss with a falling accent. Here again, you see a slight fall that continues towards the end of the phrase. There is a low target before the syllable. And the rising accent basically rises throughout the syllable and then also falls towards the end of the phrase. Um, so those are the basic facts, right? There have been long debates on how to account for these types of phenomena uh, for like tonal contrast that are restricted to stressed syllables. Um, a quote from Hyman, um, which says, the central goal of phonological typology is to determine how different languages systematize the phonetic substance available to all languages. And here we are interested in uh, the relationship between phonetic substance and prosody. So prosodic typology often divides word prosodic systems into two prototypes, right? So people talk about stress systems and people talk about tone systems. Uh, there are lots of debates around uh, how to refer to these prototypes, what kind of prototypes are there. Here I will not go into that in too much detail, but what's relevant for us is that there are several languages that combine elements of both stress and lexically contrastive tonal melodies within syllables, meaning you have tonal contrasts, but only in stressed syllables, typically so-called bimoraic syllables, right? You have Franconian, Lithuanian, Norwegian, Scottish Gaelic, and so on and so on. One of these languages is Shina. Um, and there is a decade long debate on how we should analyze systems of that type. Um, there are roughly, I would say there are three approaches. So either you say that syllables carry stress, and then uh, some of these syllables can have a lexical tone or not. I think this is the most widespread approach, which is why I informally call it mainstream here. Uh, Hyman's work represents that. Um, and that approach that says that um, stress is syllabic prominence excludes every kind of type of prominence below the level of the syllable. Therefore, something like mora stress or moraic stress doesn't, should not exist. Right. Um, there are, however, other approaches uh, that allow for more prominence. And uh, for instance, Van der Hulst's uh, work over the past 10 or 15 years has often focused on talking about uh, certain types of moraic prominence, where you could, for instance, say um, the first part of a long vowel is stressed or has prominence, and the second part of a long vowel has prominence, typically that's marked with a diacritic, and uh, in such an approach, it would be no lexical tone. A third approach um, is what I call contrastive foot structure, where we also work without lexical tone, right? I don't think I said that, but if you have moraic prominence and you can have stress on the first or the second part of a vowel, you do not need to make reference to a lexical tone, so it's like a trade-off relationship. Right? And the third, pro third approach uh, is to use contrastive foot structure, to not use lexical tone. Um, Moen Dualia has worked like that. Yossa 2015 has, has worked like that. I have worked like that. There will be more references later. And that the idea is that you have, for instance, two types of feet, and those two types of feet give you different tonal melodies. And that will also be my analysis of the Shina data. OK. now. Uh, we move on to that analysis, um, and the question, right, in my foot-based approach is how to associate tones to tone-bearing units. Well, the basic assumption is that long vowels have two moras, right? That's not uh, very radical unless you think that moras are totally off, but many people work with them. So in there, a long vowel has two moras, and tones are associated with moras. That's very traditional. Um, then what you have to do in such an analysis is um, identify the tones and the associations. Uh, Schmidt and Koistani had low, high and high, low, right? But I, I already told you that I think that the falling tone isn't really falling only in the syllable, but that it continues. So I will propose um, a low, high star. The high star is like, you know, a star tone of an international melody that has to go to a uh, prominent unit. Um, I will say that there's a low high star word prominence pitch accent for, for these words and the association differs and that's what gives you the tonal contrast, right? I will show that in step two. 
Um, and then in step three, we'll be looking at stress advancement where, as I claim, uh, there are some things in there that uh, can very nicely be brought in line with um, the first part of the analysis. Okay, now, this is just the tonal mapping, right? So this basically says, this is the, uh, the falling tone and the falling tone has a high star in the stressed syllable and then it falls towards what I refer to here as a low boundary tone. And as you can see, there is a low tone before that stressed syllable. And oops, yes. And in contrast, the rising tone has a low and a high star in the stressed syllable on the stressed vowel, but then also falls towards the end, right? So if you look at this briefly, the difference is that here we only have one tone in the stress syllable, which is the high star for the falling accent. And for the rising accent, we have a low and a high tone in the stressed syllable. And in the next step, we'll have to think about how do we get to those types of associations. Um, so the ingredients for my analysis are that, um, based on the foot inventory uh, that Winnie Kache has proposed in 1993, I assume that China has two types of feet, moray trochees that are built directly on mora. So it's a binary foot that combines two moras, a head and a dependent mora. And I say that this leads to falling accent and there is a syllabic trochee that is built on syllables. So on a higher node, and that's what leads to rising accent. And my work uh, in like over the past, I don't know, 10 years or so, um, has assumed that moraic and syllabic trochees differ in the metrical strength of their moras. And in other words, they differ in their ability to host tone. And I will talk about this in a second. Okay, here we go. Um, so we do have that low high star pitch accent that I was talking about, and somehow it has to go to these um, different units in a different way. Um, here you have a moraic trochee, and the pluses and minuses are not really meaningful. They're just notational devices to, to show you what a head is. And what a dependent is, and for the moraic trochee, it basically means the first mora of a long vowel will be the head, and the second mora will be the dependent. And in my work on Franconian uh, tonal accent, I have assumed that, I mean, at least some Franconian dialects and also other languages that I've worked on, you have these restrictions that only strong moras can license a tone. So here it would be the foot head can license a tone, we have the low high star melody. The start tone is, you know, the most important tone of that melody. So it has to be associated with a strong element. So it goes to this first mora. Um, the, you cannot have two tones on one mora because of some kind of constraint against contours. Therefore, the low tone has to be realized before the stressed vowel. And that's what gives you this fall that then continues towards the end of the phrase, right? You only have a high tone on that syllable. Now, the syllabic trochee is built on syllables. And now here's the crux. The crucial thing is that the syllable is a head and of a foot, a foot head, and the syllable dominates two moras. And uh, they are both strong moras because they are sort of licensed by the syllable head. So all tones that are associated with these moras are also associated licensed by the foot head. And that metrical strength at the foot level allows each of these two moras to realize a tone. So the L can go to the first mora, the H goes to the second mora. So you get a rising tone within the stressed syllable, whereas here where only one tone can be licensed, uh, you realize the high tone and you get the falling accent. That's what gives you falling versus rising accent. Okay, so um, in my approach, the analysis of mora stress follows from a contrast between two types of feet, right? But then the question is, couldn't we also analyze it as stress plus lexical tone or just as a diacritic marking? The location of the, of the high tone, like, you know, have a diacritic mark on the first mora, have one on the second mora, and this is exactly where I think that the relevance of stress advancement uh, comes in. Okay, and now, 
stress advancement. What's stress advancement? Um, first of all, the basics is stems and suffixes can be stressed in Sheena. And sometimes there is a conflict where both stem and suffix are potentially stress attracting. And then if the stem final syllable has a rising accent, so a high tone on the last mora, the suffix will win. Uh, so that's when you get stress advancement from the stem to the suffix. If, however, a non-final mora is stressed or has a high tone, in other words, then the stem wins. There is no stress advancement. Um, uh, Schmidt and Koistani refer to this as phonologically conditioned, meaning that it's a predictable uh, interaction when we have that. And Bart has written that stress advancement is a distinctive feature of Shina type languages. Those of you who know uh, accentology, um, I have a few slides at the end that I won't really talk about um, due to time constraints, but that's basically the same thing that you can see in the Saussure's law in Lithuanian. I just wanted to quickly mention this. Okay, so these are the data. You have the word for direction, and here's the plural, right? A marks the plural, and here E marks the plural. As you can see in the singular, the accent is on the second part of the long vowel, and then it shifts to the suffix upon prefixation. But if you have here the word for house versus the word for house, houses, uh, or the word for name and the word for names, stress is on the first mora and it stays on that mora. It does not advance to the suffix and that's something that's in need of explanation. Right, so how do I do this? Um, first, I assume that underlying stress or whatever you wanna call it is stored with underlying foot structure. Um, the default for China is that the leftmost foot wins. That's basically the basic accentuation principle as proposed in, EG, uh, in for instance, Kiparsky and Halley, 1977. However, and this is the crucial thing, if an underlying head would be demoted to a dependent, that principle is overridden. I call this the head demotion principle, which basically says if you are a foot head underlyingly, don't make me a foot dependent. So that means the hierarchy is being ahead is obviously, you know, what everyone wants, what's the best. Being unparsed is worse than being ahead, but being unparsed is not as bad as being a dependent. And if we work with this principle, um, here you see underlyingly gnome comes with a moraic trochee. Here the suffix comes with, uh, I mean, I gave this as a syllabic foot, or we could also give it as a moraic foot, they would be, because it's a short vowel, you know, there's no contrast, that's not meaningful, there would not be a difference, but the point is, you get those two feet, there's only one foot per word, a very common principle in many languages. Um, and so what we get is, because of the basic accentuation principle, the left foot wins, no stress advancement. Um, However, what happens in cases where there is stress advancement? So here we have a syllabic foot and we have another syllabic foot. Now, the crucial thing is, you know, when you can build a binary syllabic foot, you have to do it because of principles of foot binarity, all that kind of stuff. So that means if the syllabic foot wins, it will have to include the suffix syllable in the foot to be binary and then we violate, violate the head demotion principle because the underlying head of the suffix, right, becomes a foot dependent. And that's bad. That's something that uh, uh, is not tolerated in China. What's the way out? The way out is in that situation, um, syllabic trochee on the stem, uh, syllabic uh, uh, trochee on the suffix is to let the suffix win because the feet are trochaic, so you can only branch to the right. But that means that the stem foot uh, is not becoming a foot dependent, but it is 
only unparsed and going from head to unparsed is fine. You just can't become a foot dependent. I just realized that I didn't say earlier that unstressed bowels shorten, right? That's very common in many languages. So it loses its foot, the vowel is shortened, and the suffix wins. And that's the whole analysis. And what I would like to point out is that this is something that follows from binarity restrictions in foot structure. How would other approaches do that? I mean, I would, I would say uh, that lexical tone and diacritic approaches can capture the patterns, yes, but they don't really have the possibility to offer a principled account of this, right? So I will just give an example for a diacritic approach. You could have two rules that say um, um, prominent mora, non-prominent mora, prominent mora gives you the leftmost wins when the diacritics are non-adjacent, and if they are adjacent, then the rightmost wins. That would be easy to write two rules of that type, but it would not be, I would say, not particularly insightful because it would just restate the data. So that's why I think that my foot-based approach allows us to um, incorporate insights from a foot structure, which basically is that we do have binary windows, and that these binary windows can make a difference in how uh, the winner of these two underlying accents is determined. And so therefore, I think this is a more principled account of adjacency. So moving towards my conclusions. Um, first of all, the theoretical relevance uh, of this is that the metrical approach is in line with a lot of work that analyzes certain tone contrasts within stressed syllables as foot-based. I give a few examples here. Um, um, there is more work on this, but this is just, you know, to show that this is not an isolated thing for, for Sheena. Um, but that kind of approach, uh, that foot-based approach to those tonal contrasts challenges the current mainstream view in prosodic typology, where it is assumed that lexically lexically contrastive prominence below the syllable level must be attributed to lexical tone, right? So what I and other people are putting out there is the idea that, well, maybe that's not always true for these kinds of binary tonal contrasts. And for Sheena, um, I believe that an approach with binary metric constituents, in other words, feet, is preferable to analyses with lexical tone or grid marks for conceptual reasons, as I've just outlined. Okay, and that's it. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few more slides at the end. Uh, if anyone is interested in reading them, I'll just go through them here. You can stop um, and look at them. I hope it will be self-explanatory, uh, but basically it makes the claim that that similar pattern in Lithuanian can be analyzed along the same lines. Okay, and that is my talk. I will stop sharing, stop the recording. Thank you for watching this. Uh, I really appreciate it and I'm looking forward to the conference.